Today's podcast of Hellben for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Hellben for Horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. It is after midnight when I realize that the fog has overtaken me. I am carefully walking over smooth stones that are slick from a constant, heavy mist of water. I have no flashlight. And I am alone. I have come to this moor in South Iceland to find a legendary beast that guards a hidden treasure. I hear the beast before I can see it. This beast will not chase me, nor will it retreat. It chases after no one. It is patient. It lets your curiosity choose your fate. It's your decision whether you get too close or not. I suddenly realize that I am only about 10 steps away from oblivion. I am right on the water's edge, standing precariously on the last stones of a shoreline. I am looking straight up at the 203 foot tall, 82 foot wide Skogafoss waterfall. I swear that the thing glows behind the swirl of mist and fog that's in the air. There is no fence here to keep you at a safe distance. I look behind me. There is nobody around. I could so easily just disappear here. I could end right here with just a few steps. I am literally struggling to not fall backwards from the force of air being pushed out of the way by this beast. The ground hums and vibrates from its power. The noise is hypnotic. The sheets of pounding water are hypnotic. I am pelted with spray and wind. They shoot into my mouth and chill my lungs. All of a sudden, I start to laugh and shout. I feel absolutely wild. If you've listened to my previous podcasts, you probably heard me discuss my feelings around nature. I tend to think that nature in itself is so unknown to us in its vastness that the term supernatural is redundant. As much as we know about nature, there is so much that is still alien to us. We might be able to follow patterns and discover physical rules, but nature still manages to make scientists and geologists and meteorologists just shrug. Just when we think we are getting a hang of the game, nature kicks over the metaphysical chessboard on us. To me, nature is the epitome of a Lovecraftian elder god. It is awesome in its power, and it is indifferent to whether we live or die. I know, pretty dramatic, right? But I live in Northern California, and every so often the earth gives us a little jostle just to remind us about how temporary everything can be. And when it does that, people get scared. Quick. When nature gives us a smackdown, we all become animists. We all fear the monster. And, and that's nothing new. This is where our fairy tales and our legends and our folklore come from. Now, with that said, we live in a decidedly modern world. Folklore doesn't filter into everyday life, unless you count Sasquatch. But there are still places in the world where nature is so extreme and is so much of a presence in everyday life that the line between the natural and the supernatural just disappears. And from all accounts, it's a rough world for monsters and men alike. Now, I'd wanted to go to Iceland ever since I saw a PBS documentary about the volcanoes and the glaciers and the geothermal energy that the country ran on. 
It sounded so alien to any place I'd ever been before. I also hoped to learn about the rich vein of folklore and ghost stories in the culture. Iceland is the newest landmass on the planet. It was formed by underground volcanoes about 16 million years ago. In geologic time, that's infancy. Iceland is in between two oceans, the North Atlantic and the Arctic. And even though it sits just outside of the Arctic Circle, it is warmed by the volcanoes beneath it. The island is part of both the Eurasian and the North American tectonic plates. In other words, it is where two moving parts of the world collide. There are small earthquakes daily. When the earthquakes are not small, they create tsunamis. One Icelander told me about watching massive icebergs tumbling ashore like giant blue 20-sided dice from Dungeons and Dragons. He said it was equally beautiful and terrifying. Horrible beautiful. Iceland seems suspended between two worlds, fire and ice. Volcanoes rest between huge glaciers. Some lakes bubble and steam from geothermal vents. You can smell the sulfur in the air. Some lakes bubble from natural carbonation from minerals. The land itself alternates between huge, jagged mountain ranges and flat, desolate plains. Some of those desolate plains are a flat, black landscape as far as the eye can see. It is land covered with volcanic ash. The other desolate plains are covered with large, moss-covered boulders as far as the eye can see. Now these are lava flows. Geysers burst through the ground. You can hear the earth growl in the geyser fields. This island is so far north that even the sun doesn't know how to deal with it. In the summer, it never gets completely dark, and in the winter, it never gets completely light. Iceland is in a suspended twilight, as if living in a dream state. It is a fertile playground for superstitions and imagination. When you see Iceland, it's hard not to feel that the land itself is absolutely alive, and that you are an interloper in a land made for much bigger and badder things. A lot of Icelanders feel there are two worlds living right next to each other on this island. When you see the rocks of the lava field stretching for miles in the twilight, you can imagine it too. Not that Icelanders are nervous, superstitious villagers right out of the old Universal Monster movies. In fact, they are quite the opposite. From my discussions with different people, Icelanders are very pragmatic. I mean, this is a country that has an official religion, Lutheranism. You're born into it. But the church holds less power and sway than in countries that have a clear separation between church and state. Right outside of the largest church in Reykjavik, called Hallgrim Circa, the streets are named after Norse gods like Odin, Thor, and Freya. The belief system in Iceland is a lot like that juxtaposition of Christian and Norse. They don't battle each other, they just find ways to coexist. When I spoke with different people about the magical and invisible and vicious beings in Icelandic folklore, the most common response I got was this. I don't believe in that stuff, but I don't tempt fate either. That stuff tends to be defined as the three types of magical beings that are still relevant in Iceland. There are the elves who live in the rocks. There are the trolls who live in caves and turn into stone in the daylight. And then there are the huldafolk, the hidden people. They are invisible, but can become visible to walk amongst humans, mostly to screw with them. And this, to many Icelanders, is natural. The supernatural is just a natural part of modern life. What this means in modern life is that roads still get diverted if they're too close to rock formations believed to house elves. You can actually go on YouTube and see news reports about this. If there are two houses that are built with an elf rock in between them, the elf rock gets a home address too. In other words, the first house is number one, the rock is number two, the next house is number three. Clairvoyants are hired to draw spirit maps of where the Hulda folk live so town residents can keep their distance. I've learned it's best not to cross any Hulda folk. The definition of what the elves are and what the hidden people are is tricky. Icelanders say they are two different things, but they admit the stories about them are rather similar. I spoke with historian and poet Kristen Savara Thomasdottir at the Skogar Folk Museum about this. 
dwarves or elves, are they hidden people or is that a different category? It's a different thing really and what, what I what I find like the funniest part of it because it's been made into a bit of a, like a tourist thing with the elves. <laughs> right. Um, but many because many many people picture just like yeah, just dwarves like you would have like garden gnomes or something like that. Right. Um, but the hidden people uh, that we had stories about in Iceland, uh, they were not tiny, uh, they were invisible, usually, uh, and they weren't all that cute, you know, because people pictured elves like something, you know, cute and small and, and really nice like that, but they were, they were kind of mean, usually. I mean, they, they were supposed to live in, in rocks and, um, yeah, rocks and mostly and, and hills and stuff like that. Um, and they would, I mean, the kind of, it was like kind of a, a coexistence with the humans that was usually peaceful and there could be some collaboration, but you also had um, the, the hidden people, but also sometimes kind of uh, kidnap people like humans, they would like, uh, they would be, they were also dangerous, they would maybe sing and you would be really fascinated by them and you then would just disappear into the rock and never be seen again. I mean, all these kinds of just legends, both of the hidden people and trolls and whatever you have not. Um, it just it coexisted kind of with the, uh, you also had, of course, very big influence of the church and the Christianity, but then you had, they had these popular beliefs as well. And the influence of the church is everywhere. You can see it on the spirit maps even. If you look on a spirit map legend, you'll find elves and hidden people listed, but you'll also find light fairies and bright elven beings. Those are the versions of the magical beings that the church is more comfortable with. And there is a version of the origin of elves that includes Adam and Eve. Spoiler alert, Eve gets the blame again. So elves can be child-sized or adult-sized. They live in rocks, but really all we see is a rock or a set of rocks. The actual homes and villages are large and are on a different frequency or in a different dimension. Some clairvoyants can see the houses. Interestingly enough, many children can too. Elves are dangerous. They use their beauty and their songs to lure people into the rocks and pull them inside. They are also baby stealers. They replace newborn babies with a changeling, a half-elf lookalike. The hidden people are invisible and walk amongst us, but some hidden people prefer to be visible and interact with humans, so you might be talking to a hidden person and not even know it. They are described as beautiful and immaculately dressed, normally in blue. For the most part, the Hulda folk are neutral about humans, but when they do decide to interact with humans, it's rarely pleasant. For most Icelanders, especially those in cities like Reykjavik, they see the hidden people as a personification of the forces of nature. Now, if you were to break down the percentages of how Icelanders feel about elves and hidden people and trolls, it would go like this. 5% of the people are true believers, and 10% don't believe at all. 85% fall somewhere in between. They're open to the belief that something might be out there. Why tempt fate? This pragmatism might be born from living in a landscape that is so unpredictable, it is best not to get too attached to anything. They've seen what the elder gods can do. Here today, gone tomorrow, anything can change. I asked Kristen Savara, Thomas' daughter, whether she felt there was a connection between belief in magical beings and a connection to nature. Mm, probably there was. I mean, it's natural you, when you're just, I mean, until the, that, that's one of the remarkable things I tried to point out to people when they come for guided tours here, for example, is that there weren't really any towns in Iceland until the late 18th century. And even then, this, uh, this process of, of like urbanization started very slowly. Um, and it wasn't really until the 20th century that you had this speeding up a bit. So this was a rural, totally rural society, really. You didn't have any urban centers. So it was, uh, and it was just like 95% of Icelanders were farmers. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was just a rural farming society for until the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when you when you live like that, you're of course I mean sure. the season is the the seasonal 
thing is the important thing and you live in very close connection with nature, but this has changed very fast in the 20th century. Of course, the further out of the city you go, the more belief there is. And so I headed out to the country in the eternal twilight, surrounded by nothing but mountains and lava fields. I drove to the Snifelsnes Peninsula on the west side of Iceland. The peninsula is breathtakingly beautiful. Somehow it is simultaneously isolating in its broad open spaces and imposing with its huge claw-like mountains and volcanoes. This is the land of the trolls and the hidden people. Huge rock formations look like frozen beasts in the valleys. And this is the land of Baldor Snaefelsness, a half-man, half-troll who murdered his nephews after they set his daughter afloat on an iceberg that floated all the way to Greenland. The half-troll brothers are frozen into the canyons and cliffs where he killed them. Then there is Snaefels Yokel Volcano. The folklore says that the many lava caves made by Snaefels Yokel are the domain of trolls. There are miles of unexcavated lava caves that allow trolls to appear and disappear at will, usually right after they make a meal out of a lost traveler. Of course, I needed to go into one of these lava caves. To enter Vatnaschiller Cave, you need to go to a locked metal shed out in the lava field. Above the door is written one word, Underheimer. Translation, Underworld. Our tour guide hands us each a flashlight and helmet. We descend 115 feet into the guts of the earth by way of a slick, cold, spiral staircase. In absolute darkness, you realize just how feeble a flashlight beam really is. The beam is like a chalk line on a chalkboard. There's no bleed off. I look around. I am surrounded by stalagmites and stalactites, but what shocks me is how high the ceiling is. The flashlight beam just seems to make it to this moist, sparkling dome. It is literally impossible for me to not think of Neil Marshall's excellent cave horror movie, The Descent. I move my flashlight beam and half expect to see a white humanoid beast scurry away. The legend of this particular cave is that it used to be inhabited by Baldor, the half troll. It does not feel abandoned. It doesn't feel crypt-like or hollow. It feels alive. Our tour guide shines a light on the sparkly nature of the walls. Can anyone guess what this is, she asks. There happens to be a microbiologist on the tour. Bacteria, she replies. She also sniffs the bacteria. It smells like streptomyces. The tour guide is stunned. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. You bet this place is alive. We are surrounded by life. It is in the air. It is in the water dripping on our helmets. When we are about two football fields away from the spiral staircase, our only hope for exit, the tour guide tells us to turn off our lights. Only her flashlight beams. She tells us to close our eyes. We do. A moment passes. I can hear dripping water everywhere around me. And then she tells us to open our eyes. We are met with total darkness. How can I explain what I felt? When I opened my eyes to this darkness, I felt a weight, a mass to it, like the darkness bumped me. It felt like when my dentist puts a lead vest on me to take an x-ray. I heard everyone else gasp and go quiet. They felt it too. I didn't need a pale creature from a horror movie next to me. The darkness itself was sniffing me out, circling me, like a carnivorous animal. This darkness was older than man. I was breathing in its ancientness. But the darkness knew I was temporary. I was the alien. When we got up to the surface, I spoke with my tour guide. I asked her the same question I ask everyone. 
Do you believe in trolls, hidden people, elves? Her answer, she's an educated geologist. She's never seen a troll. And yet her answer was, I don't tempt fate. She also let me know that as I go west on the peninsula, I'm going to find more believers. I find myself driving through mile after mile of lava field on a narrow road. I'm driving through this to get to a shark museum. When I get there, I find that it's more of a shark meat farm. The family on the farm hunts sharks and makes a traditional food called rotten shark. Don't ask. Yes, it tastes exactly like it sounds. It was here that I got to meet Christian Hildebrandsen, shark catcher, museum curator. Christian told me he was in the Why Tempt Fate camp about elves and trolls, but he said that his father is a true believer. I have to say that the way Christian talked, he might have been closer to a believer than he was letting on. And if you ever travel through a lava like this, <clears throat> in the dark, with, and you stop your car and go outside, then you know why people made the stories about the trolls. Yeah, it can be pretty scary to stand there in the darkness with all those shadows and not a sound. He told me how trolls are acclimated into the modern world by way of a very unexpected route, Santa Claus. If you thought Krampus was bad, wait until you hear about the Yule Lads of Iceland. These were 13 psychopath trolls that visited your town one day at a time to wreak havoc and drag children back to their cave to eat them. Right around the holiday season, of course. One of the Yule lads, known as Lung Splatter, had his lungs outside of his body and he would beat the children to death with them. Others would steal your food and loosen knots so your livestock would run away. These days, the Yule lads are regulated to being pranksters and even leave gifts for children if they're appeased. Uh, the different Santa Clauses would have names like Door Slammer and you have 13 different yes. ones? One would steal your meat, one would lick. Lick the spoons and, and just <laughs> many things. Now, is that if you were bad? No. Or is that just, they just come in and do that? They were pranksters. Okay, so your Santa Claus is 13 of them uh, are pranksters for yeah. the most part. But then when the U.S. Navy came here, and we, then we learned of this, this jolly right. <laughs> Santa Claus. And then we got that influence here. So now, in the end, every kid has one who is their favorite. Uh -huh. And so for that one, you leave a gift in a zoo. What was your favorite? The one who was stealing candles. And well, he was eating them. <laughs> of course, I had to ask him about the hidden people and elves. Christian answered with candor. Are hidden people and elves different, or are they part of hidden people? Well, they are different, but their stories are very similar and often get mixed. Okay. For the most part, they have good intention if they interact with people? Some of them, and, well, according to uh, stories, many of them are just dicks. <laughs> Christian also told me about a popular folk song where the queen of the hidden people saw a man she wanted to have children with. He was already married, so he refused her. She asked again, and he refused her again. The song ends with her stabbing him to death. Now, I'm not sure what the moral of the story is, but this kind of treachery is common. A few generations ago, people used to have one person stay at home during Sunday church service just to watch out for hidden people who would take over the home. But Sometimes the risk of meeting a hidden person pays off in unexpected rewards. Christian takes me to look at a golden candlestick at the back of the museum. It has a story behind it. This candlestick here, it's like a, their family heirloom. Okay. And it was some time ago, that hundreds of years, something. I don't remember the details. <clears throat> you know, the hidden people, they are all look like human but are very well dressed okay and so this fine dressed woman comes comes to his house and she asked as for help there there's a trouble with with birth and, and so the the farmer runs with them and into the hole in, in the ground and there is a hidden woman having trouble giving birth and he 
he helps them. Yeah, and after, and yeah, it went, went great. And after that, he, he wakes up in his bed, uh -huh. still with blood on his sleeves, oh, wow. and this can candlestick next to the bed. Christian then took me outside to show me where he played as a child. There were small hills on the property. One stood out because it was overgrown with weeds and tall grass. I found out this was an elf village. I was told that you don't touch those hills. People have been found dead after they moved rocks or pulled out weeds near elf villages. Elves are bad news. I soaked in all that Christian was saying. I didn't need to tell him that the hotel I was staying in that night was within walking distance of a large elf village, and I intended to walk through that village right around midnight. If there was one thing I learned from speaking to everyone is that you don't mess around with any rock formations. Feel free to pick up a rock on a path, but if you see a rock on top of another rock, don't pick it up. If you believe in elves or hidden people, you can be followed home and killed. If you're a Christian, pastors use rocks to entrap ghosts during exorcisms. They put the rock on a cairn. If you pick it up, you just bought yourself a ghostly possession. However, walking on a rock formation that is the hiding place for an elf village? If you really want to do it, the rule is simple. Stay on the path and you'll know the path when you see it. The name of the fairy village of where I'm going is Alphaborg. It sits to the northeast of a lake about a quarter mile away from the hotel I'm staying at. Now, I've been walking alone around midnight every night of my visit thanks to the eternal twilight. I really enjoy the empty streets and the dreamy feel of that time of night, and you can see quite a bit. It was always bright enough that I never took a flashlight, and I decided I didn't need one on the night I visited the elf village. Once I got past the manicured lawn of the hotel, I felt it might have been a mistake. This was the outdoors. I was on a dirt path that slithered through the chest-high brush and the weeds. That brush was moving and alive with birds. I guess they don't sleep in the twilight either. It was bright enough to see my footing, but it was that kind of dusk where you can't judge distances, and you can't tell if something's a shadow or not. All I knew is that this path was slowly veering away from the lake, and the hotel looked very small when I looked back. And, and suddenly the path was sending me up a blind hill. I couldn't see the top or see over it. It was at that moment when I turned to my left and saw a human form standing amongst the rocks watching me. A moment later, I realized it was just one of the lava rocks that was standing at a really interesting tilted angle. I knew firsthand now what Christian meant about being alone with the lava rocks. Now the creepy feeling it gave me, it just wouldn't leave me. There just wasn't enough light or enough detail to wash it completely away. I saw the long ridge of rock sitting alone on the lowlands. Everything around it was flat except for this large rock formation. I knew I had come upon Alphaborg. I could see the distinguishing marks that the local legend talked about. On the eastern end was a tall spire of stone. They called that the Elf Church. The steady up and down of the rock formations did remind me of different buildings, if the suggestion was already in your head. I stood in front of the Elf Church. It was bigger than I thought it was. And then I saw another human form. I knew it was a rock with a, a tiny bush at the top. And yet, what if the hidden people were like chameleons blending in? What if, like a poltergeist, they get the energy to appear from your fear? And then I saw the path that went up into the rock formation. I went up. I walked the path that cut through the center of the two rock faces that make up Alphaborg. 
All I saw were rocks and shadows. There were no ominous sounds. At one point, there was a bed of purple flowers in front of me. They had grown across a path. I have to admit, I jumped over them. Do you know when I was at my most nervous? On the way back to the hotel. When I had to turn my back on Alpha Borg in that twilight. When I had to turn my back on those stones that were angled in a way that mimicked human posture. When I saw how far I really was from my hotel. Now, not all of the dark history of Iceland is made by monsters. Some of the dark history is all too human. In the 1500s, this was the hunting ground of the most notorious serial killer in Icelandic history. His name was Bjorn Peterson, but he came to be known as Axler Bjorn. Over several decades, Axler hacked 18 people apart with an axe. Now, Bjorn was the original B&B guy of Iceland. He would take in travelers and murder them, then sell their clothes and horses and be belongings for money. He was caught when one of the two children he had attacked got away and told the authorities. Axler Bjorn was beheaded in 1596. Then there's Thingvellir National Park. It's a gorgeous tourist destination with waterfalls, gorges, and beautiful vistas. Thingvellir is revered for a few different reasons. It's where you can see the Eurasian and North American tectonic plates meet. It's also the site where Iceland's parliament, Althingi, was founded in 930 AD. Thingvellir is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is also the site where 72 people were executed in various ways, many of which the crime was witchcraft. Thingvellir is horrible beautiful. There's a pond named Drakengar Hiller where 18 women were drowned. There is a spot nearby that known as Slaughter Sandbank where 30 men were beheaded. Gallows Rock sits in a rift between two stone walls. 15 men were hanged there. And near that is a picturesque spot called Fire Gorge, where nine men and women were burned at the stake. The witch hunting started in 1625 when a pastor named Jan Magnusson accused a father and son, both members of the choir, of sorcery that caused his prolonged illness. Both men were burned at the stake. The pastor got their land. When the pastor didn't get better, he accused the daughter of the family. The aftermath of the witch hunt left 23 dead. However, in Iceland, some of the sorcery was real. On display at the Museum of Icelandic Witchcraft and Sorcery in Holmavik hangs the only known pair of necropants still in existence. What are necropants, you ask? It is the flayed skin of a man from the waist down, all intact, ready to wear. Soles of feet included, penis included. Necropants, or nabrok, were created from a deal struck between two sorcerers. When one of them died, they gave permission to the other to dig up his body, peel the skin in one piece, and wear it. This was supposed to bring great wealth. However, all of the violence of men pales next to the indifferent violence of the land. All the sorcery pales next to the unforeseen storms and earthquakes and volcanoes. I passed what looked like a modern art sculpture out in the black ash wastelands on the Ring Road. A sign told me it was the remnants of a bridge and an old highway after an iceberg tore through. I looked around. There was no river or body of water in sight. Although they aren't as celebrated as elves and hidden people, there are plenty of water monsters. There are mermen and sea serpents and lake monsters. There are ghosts like the Deacon of Dark River that are linked to rivers and streams. For every waterfall, there seems to be a tragedy tied with it, and the tragedy takes on legend. Barnafoss is a waterfall that gets its name from the disappearance of two children at a stone arch over the falls. 
The family had left the children at home while they went to church. When they returned, the children were gone. But the children left footprints from the front door down to the river, leading to the stone arch over the falls. It was assumed they fell in and drowned. But why did they leave the house? Were the children lured there by something? The arch was destroyed and a legend was born. And then there's Godafoss, the waterfall of the gods in the northern part of Iceland. The legend has it that in the year 1000, a prominent chieftain decided to adopt Christianity. He took all the statues of pagan gods and threw them over the waterfall. Some say the gods are all there in that waterfall. Some say that since the waterfall is up north, the gods traveled down the rivers. But let's get back to Skogafoss and me standing at the edge of the shore. When I first pulled up to Skogafoss around midnight, I decided to climb 400 wobbly steps on the side of the mountain to visit the top of the waterfall. The twilight visibility was good and I heard the view up there was breathtaking. I was coming to the end of my stay in Iceland. I was cocky. The steps were very steep and they swayed. There were only patches of handrails. Sometimes there was only rope to hang on to. It was when I finally got to the top of those 400 stairs that all of a sudden it got really dark. The fog came out of nowhere and just poured into the valley. It was thick and wet. Now the 400 steps are wet. I start making my way back down slowly. My heart is racing. I am vulnerable. Even though I am 200 feet up, I remind myself that the 10 feet in front of me are the only ones I need to think about. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I see something impossible. I see a figure rising out of the fog on the cliffside. And then another. The figures stand there, looking in my direction. I stand completely still. Suddenly, I am someone living 800 years ago. There is no electricity or cars or smartphones. There is just me and the beings in the mist. And then the fog blows a little. And I see the two sheep on the mountain are curious to see who the idiot on the cliff is. And I am back in my own time. And now I am on the edge of the shoreline, looking up at what feels like impossible power. After all the legends and folklore, I suddenly feel I am finally face to face with the elder god known as Iceland. The mist and spray is sniffing me out, circling me like a carnivorous animal. This power, this elder god, is older than man, I was breathing in its ancientness. But Skogafoss knows I am temporary. I am the alien. I am ten steps away from oblivion. All of a sudden, I start to laugh and shout. I feel absolutely wild. And I step backwards, away from the beast. Is Skogafoss alive? Does it matter? After all, why tempt fate? Thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. For you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. 
To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me, and I thank you in advance. And thanks for listening. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. If you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. It really helps. Thanks a lot for listening. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast. It's now available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can also keep up with Hellbent for Horror on iTunes at iTunes Podcast. That's on Twitter. You can find more on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Hellbent for Horror. And I'm on Twitter at Hellbent Horror. You can also find more info on my website, hellbentforhorror.com. Till next time, stay hellbent.